Okay, so now I'll hand over to Brad, who's going to talk about developing your own COVID-19 dashboard. Brad's a new recruit in terms of working at UOW. He joined the Statistical Consulting Centre in July. He submitted his PhD in statistics here on statistic, statistical disclosure control. And he's also teaching the data visualization subject with Alberto in our um, brand new Bachelor of Data Science and Analytics program. And that subject will run for the first time next year. And Brad, We'll tell you a little bit about the Statistical Consulting Centre, but you can access it through Niasra. And again, I've put the link in the chat. And so without further ado, I will hand over to Brad. Thanks, Marika. Um, so before I begin, what I'm going to do is just put in the, the chat um, a, a, a R script so everyone can see what code we use to uh, produce a lot of the images in, uh, in the slides today. Um, I'll also, when we get to it, put in the code for the Shiny app so you can have a play around with it yourself as well. Um, but what I'm going to do, let me now share my screen. Ooh, hang on, I'll share my screen first and then I'll go into presentation mode. There we go. Is that, is that all right? Yes. Yep, cool. So um, today what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you guys through um, just how you would, if you, if you were interested, um, trying to build your own COVID-19 dashboard. Now, um, we probably, probably would have been more useful to have this talk a couple of weeks ago when we were all desperate to get the vaccine numbers up. Um, but in the meantime, we can definitely go through and you can um, maybe just give a taster of how you might look at data that is freely available and put it into visualizations that allow you to learn something that you might not have known um, or you know without having to wait for somebody else to tell you in the news reports. Um, but before we get into that I just want to give a little bit of uh, discussion about uh, who I am. So I'm a statistical consultant within the Statistical Consulting Center um, and the Statistical Consulting Center is just a service um, there's a centre that offers a service to all academics and postgraduate students throughout the university um, to give statistical advice on a range of different fields. Um, we currently, it's you, you get a free initial consultation um, and up to 10 hours per calendar year of consulting time, um, depending on whether or not, you know, there is funding involved and, and that kind of thing. Um, so if you, if you are interested in uh, um, the Statistical Consulting Service and having a chat with me or, or maybe Marika as well, um, you can go to the website there. I've put the address down the bottom. I think Marika also shared the address as well. Um, you can read a little bit more about what we do on the website too and book appointments through there um, and that will, that will get sent to us. So. Um, just a little bit of a plug before we begin, but if you have any questions that you need help with or, you know, whether it's to do with data visualization or, or your research in general, definitely uh, give, us a, give us a yell and, and we can have a little bit of a chat about it. All right, so um, just for today's talk, I'm going to go through seven key points here. Um, and I think you notice that three, three of these points are just about the data. Um, and it's because a lot of the time when we do our data visualizations, um, it is getting your data in the right form to be able to, to properly plot it is usually the biggest part of the battle. Um, often running the, the ggplot or the plot or whatever it is, uh, whatever software you're using, that's not usually the most difficult part. It's actually getting your data in the right form to be able to do the visualizations we want. So we're going to go through um, a few of the, the software and uh, packages available in order to be able to really get your data into the right form um, and you know, tidy it up and be able to be then used within our visualizations. We'll also um, go through a couple of different uh, vi visualization tools. So ggplot, I know Emmy Tanaka gave a great talk previously um, on ggplot, so we're gonna be using a little bit of that as well. We're also then going to use another package called ggAnimate, 
which allow, is effectively an add-on to ggplot that allows us to animate our ggplots um, across some kind of variable and get some really cool and interesting visualizations out. Um, we're also, I'm also going to give you a very, very brief touch of um, map using maps and object data, um, because I think often that can be quite intimidating, but it's, it's quite easy. A lot of the data is freely available um, and you can just load it in. And finally, what we're going to do is just have a go at putting some of the visualizations we did previously um, into a shiny dashboard so we can you know, search through and have a few interactive controls to, to um, allow us to kind of more tailor make our, our visualization experience. Um, but the first step, oh, also I, I will just say, just for those new to R, R and R Studio are both, both free to download and use. Um, and you can, all the packages we're using, you can freely download them. You just need to write one little line of code, um, which is install.packages and then whatever the package name is. Um, and then all you have to do is next time you come through it, you only have to do that once. Next time you come through to use your R, you just have to load it into your library. Um, and so uh, I'm not gonna, uh, throughout, I'm just going to say the package that we're using. Um, and so you might have to install that if you, if you haven't already installed it, um, if you're gonna try and give these things a go. If you're using RStudio, I'm pretty sure it, it flags you <laughs> when you need to install packages. So keep that in mind as well. All righty, so if we have a look at our first step, it really is all about the dump. Getting access to good quality data um, is often quite difficult. This is why the COVID-19 example is really awesome because uh, everyone's right now is really trying to share as much data as possible so we can get a good understanding of what's going on. Um, and I've got three interesting sources of data I've, I've shown here. I've also used the data.gov um, later on. I probably should have added that, but we're mostly gonna be using these resources to get our data and we can query it directly from our, um, the, the different websites that we're using. Um, so the first data set we're gonna be looking at is from data.newsouthwales. And it is just the data set of all New South Wales COVID-19 cases by location. So it's gonna tell me for every single row, that's a different case that has come up in New South Wales. It will give me um, the LGA, the postcode and the local health district as well. Um, and you can, you can find this data set online just by a simple Googling, but I'm gonna show you how to load it into R um, with just one line of code. And so um, you can do it, you can, if you have a look uh, down here, we can see the download button. You can just download it, load it manually. Um, or we can get R to query that download um, directly and just read it in as a CSV. That's option one, I've got it. But the other thing we can do is we can query the underlying data set um, underpinning this data. And that can be quite advantageous when we don't necessarily want an entire data set, but only a subset of it. Um, and so here's just a little bit of code to do it. I've, I'm effectively querying the entire data set here because I've, I've set a limit of 100,000 observations to be extracted, which is uh, bigger than the entire data set. Um, but if you, if you are interested, you can have a look at some of these, uh, some of these packages. They're really good at handling, um, querying the API and loading them into, into R. I don't want to spend too much time on that though because, um, you know, We've got, we've got a lot to get through. So, um, but just something I wanted to flag that we can do as part of, uh, of R and um, R, within R Studio. Okay, so I've loaded in my cases data set and I can show you what it looks like. I've just taken the first 20 observations here um, and you can see I've got a notification date, I've got a postcode. I've also got a local health district code and an LGA code, which you know, it's kind of a double up on the LHD name and the LGA name um, in terms of the, you know, the corresponding exactly. Um, but, you know, it might be advantageous, especially if you work in the government, to be using the codes rather than the names. We're going to just stick to the names here. 
Um, so we've got a bit of what we call um, auxiliary data or you know, um, extra data that we don't particularly need. Um, so the other thing we're gonna do, I'll, I'll just download the other files that we're gonna be using. So we've got um, our vaccination data that we can get from the Department of Health. Here, I've just put the link to it uh, directly, but again, you can find that just by some simple Googling. Um, uh, you notice I've added this little term at the end of the, of the uh, uh, script. And that's just because there's a little bit of um, information in the first two rows um, of, the, of the data set. And I kind of don't really want that. So all I've done here is told R to forget about the first two rows and um, read in the rest. And the other thing we can do is we can, this one's from a GitHub account. And I can, again, load directly from the internet into R, um, our, our materials. So I think I would have sent in that script I sent in the chat. Um, if you want to load them in yourself, you can just you know, query it. Uh, you don't have to go on a Google hunt. Um, you can just query it directly from using the script. All righty. Um, so let's go back to our original cases data set. We've got these observations. now. In order for me to really do any kind of visualization here, I'm probably going to have to change this data set in some way. Um, you know, unless I just want to get a list of all possible cases, there's not, there's not a lot in this form that I can do. So we're going to be looking at using some of the tools that have been developed in R um, as part of the Tidyverse uh, uh, suite of packages. Um, which allows us to manipulate our data set into you know, forms that are perhaps more useful. And then I've, I've if you just load the library tidyverse um, in, that will load this dplyr package and it'll also load um, a couple of other packages, the tidy R and, and associated packages as well. But um, I just wanted to give a, a quick summary on some of the key functions um, as part of this, the, dplyr um, packages within the tidyverse. The first one here is the mutate uh, function. Now this mutate function effectively allows us to add new variables or new columns um, that are functions of existing variables. So sometimes we wanna um, you know, transform or compute a new variable. We can do that all with the mutate uh, function. The other function um, we've got here is the select function that allows me to just pick out certain columns. I don't have to do it on the entire data set. Um, that helps, especially when you've got really huge data sets um, that can slow down your processing. So just extracting the variables you want is very handy a lot of the time. We've got the filter function, which allows us to just pick up certain cases um, within, within certain variables. So say I only want to you know, pick up people from the Wollongong local government area, I can use the filter function to apply that kind of condition on my data set. I've also got summarize, which allows us to do um, summary values for a range of different values, often grouped by some kind of um, other variable or other factor. And a range, which is effectively a kind of sorting function, which allows us to change the ordering of the rows. Um, the other two, two things you will see is this group by and ungroup. Now, when you group by in dplyr, you're effectively telling R that you've got, you know, distinct subsets within your data set and to treat it a little bit differently, a little bit specially. And that's going to become important when we're trying to do summary statistics down the track. And, and I'm going to show you some examples. So don't worry if right now this is all you know, just a lot of speech and not a lot of action. We'll show you in practice how we can use some of these, some of these functions. So the first one is, um, all I wanna do is I wanna tell R that notification date, um, the, that column that we had in our original data set was originally, it, it is, a, is a date, is to format it as a date so that um, when we do our plots and our, our summaries that R knows that we're talking about dates and it treats it as such. So I can use very simply, cases was our original um, name of our function. I can just mutate cases and tell it that the column notification date 
is now going to be equal to notification date, but as a date. So we're putting it in this function. So it's converting it, each of these observations into the format of a date. Um, this is kind of standard nesting sort of syntax that we see in a lot of computer programming languages. Um, but within the tidy, it, this is this mag magrita, I can't say it, um, package is actually built into tidyverse, so you don't have to load it separately. Um, th this has what's called a pipeline operator within it. And, and this can be very good to use when we're doing transformations of data sets because it lets us track um, from left to right in a very kind of ordered and intuitive way exactly what we're doing to our data set. And all we read this is, is we start with our original data set cases and I put this pipe operator and what that's telling me is that I start with cases and then I sub this into mutate and I perform this mutate operation on it. So these two things do the exact same thing. Um, sometimes you might see, if you go into help and examples online, you might see it written this way. Um, but a lot of the time, especially in a lot of the R helps, you'll see it written with this pipe operator. So um, if you're unfamiliar with that, that's all, all it is. It's just a way of um, structuring our code so that it, it's better, it's more well ordered. Um, because nesting, it can be quite confusing, especially when you're doing lots and lots of operations. Um, to work out, well, what order am I actually doing these transformations on? And a lot of the time, that's really important in our data manipulation to do it in the right set of, of, um, of steps. And we can see that in the next example here. <coughs> so um, I, can do, I can do multiple operations on the same data set, um, just using this pipeline operator by going one after the other after the other. So in this case, I'm extracting um, a data set of local government areas. So how many cases appeared in each local government areas on a particular date. So I'm going to start with my original data set. I'm going to select only these two columns because they're the two columns I'm interested in. I'm going to group by these two columns, which means that I'm going to tell R that I'm interested in distinct cases of notification date and LGA name. So for each date and for each LGA name up here, I'm gonna treat that as a separate entity within the data set. And then I'm going to count. I'm gonna apply this count function, which is effectively a summary function that just tells me how many instances appear for each group. Okay, so, and then it creates this new column N, which gives me that count. And effectively, what I can read this is, is saying that on the 25th of January in 2020, Burwood had one case of COVID, Karungai had one case of COVID, Parramatta had one case of COVID. Okay, so structuring it with the pipeline or operator allows us to do multiple uh, manipulation steps, but all in one line of code in a way that's very easy to um, tell which step followed which step and in which order we did it. All right, um, let's have a look at our next set of data manipulation tools as part of the Tidyverse. Again, this is still, this Tidy R package is part of the Tidyverse suite of packages. So if you load Tidyverse, it will also load the Tidy R package. Um, it's got a, a few important functions here too that can be very handy. Now we're not gonna use all of them um, as part of our building our COVID-19 dashboard. But I, I wanted to put them in here because I wanted to flag how useful they are. So the first two um, are really useful, um, especially, so Pivot Longer takes a wide form data set, which is effectively a data set where you might have, um, you know, if I, if, if I was looking at longitudinal data and I had one row per subject or per respondent, but I had multiple time points, and each time point was in a different column, I can use pivot longer to take all those time columns and put it into one time column with an associated other column that dictates which time point, uh, which time point it was. So um, it allows me to take a wide form data set with lots and lots of columns and convert it into a longer data set, so more rows, um, but with, with less columns. And that's often useful when you're trying to use, say, a linear mix model um, to analyze data sets. 
um, especially when we're treating all data sets. Because um, often when we store data, we store it in wide format because it's easier to read and collect. Um, but when it comes to our analysis, we do it in long format. So pivot longer is a great function for that reason. Um, so I wanted to mention that. There's also pivot wider, which effectively does the opposite. It converts something in long form into wide form. Um, and we've also got these separate and extract functions, which are very similar to, separates very similar to the, the um, text to columns function in Excel, if people are familiar with that. It effectively takes, it allows you to take one column and split it into multiple. Um, and of course the converse of that is the unite function, which allows you to take multiple columns and co convert them into one column or a single column or some combination of columns. So these again, just useful tools. We're not really gonna be using them today, but I wanted to flag them so people are aware. Um, there's also the complete function. So this, this one we will use, so we will see how the, uh, what it kind of does, but it can effectively fill in missing gaps within our data set, which are implicitly missing, meaning we don't have a row for them, but they, you know, if we were to fill in all the gaps of say, for instance, our, our COVID cases data set, if I was to fill in all the missing dates where I didn't have a case, um, the complete function allows me to do that. And of course the drop NA function is the converse of that. If we have rows which are effectively missing within our data set, they've got nothing in them, we can drop them and lower our, our row count to simply observations that we have data for. Um, the last two functions there we have are the fill function, which allows us to replace missing values based on the next to previous value. Um, so that's quite handy when you have say, you know, systematic missing. So you know what, someone might have recorded the date once and then only re recorded the date when, um, you know, when it changed date. So it's implicit that all the empty cells under that are, are corresponds to the original date, um, the, date the, the first date above it, um, or the date below it. So we can use the fill function to fill in the gaps, which are systematic in that way. And of course we can use the replace and, and a function to replace any missing values based on some known value. So if I wanna treat all NAs as zeros, I can just run um, the replace NA function on top of that. There are of course more tidy up functions and dplyr functions, but these are I think a good starting point, good tools that um, it's good to have a bit of understanding of and a bit of awareness of. All right, so um, if we go back to our cases data set, we have, um, our cases uh, grouped by notification date count. Now I'm doing this for all of New South Wales. So I've dropped the LGA name from, from my grouping function because right, I just want to look at the number of cases on each day in total in New South Wales. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell R to add a row for every date that's missing between the first, the 25th of January in 2020 and it says system dates, so that's whatever the date is today, minus two. So I give, um, you know, in case there's a, a delay in updating the cases, I've gotten a two day buffer for recent um, when I'm completing my data set. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell it to, whenever there's an NA in the N column to replace it with zero, because that means we didn't have any cases on that day. And so I wanna, I wanna have that as a, a zero, uh, recorded as a zero in our number of cases. All right, um, and the last step here is just to ungroup this. This allows us to do other kinds of functions later on, which um, don't necessarily assume a grouping structure to the notification date. All righty, um, the other thing we're gonna do is, uh, and I'm gonna use this, this package to do it, is I'm going to add a rolling mean, a seven day average rolling mean um, to my cases data set, because often, you know, seeing the jagged histograms of cases can be quite confusing. Um, so if I have this nice smooth curve over the top, um, that can help us really see what underlying trends are going on. And so I just use my mutate function to create a new, a new column average, which is equal to the roll mean or the rolling mean of N um, over seven days. And of course, at the end points, the, there's gonna be a few missing points. So I'm just telling that to fill it in as NA, we'll just drop them off. 
All righty. Um, so we, we've now got our data sorted. We can obtain our first visualization um, because I've told it to, I've, got, I've now got a row for every single date. I've got a, a non a non missing value um, for each for each uh, number of cases for each of those days, and so I can use ggplot to produce an image of um, how many cases we saw. And I'm just going to use a bar graph to do it. Um, so I'm going to say I'm going to do a ggplot on this data set. I'm going to use the aesthetic mappings um, of x. So my on my x axis, I want to have it refer to the notification date. On my y-axis, I want it to refer to the number of observations or the number of cases on each of those notification dates. I'm also going to group by notification date, which will come in, in handy later when we do our, uh, our animations. Um, the stat here just says I, I just want to have the raw count. I don't want to do anything to it. I don't want to scale it. I don't want to take mean or I don't want to aggregate multiple dates on, into one bar. I want to have just the raw count on each day. Um, and the position dodge ensures that I have it separate for each day. And of course, I want it to be colored blue. So I'm going to tell it to fill in my bar graph as blue. Um, these, other, these other arguments that I've added just are about how the image is going to look. So I've got a black and white theme. Um, I've told it to name my X axis notification date, my Y axis number of cases and put a title on it to say COVID-19 case numbers for New South Wales. And if we um, have a look, we can see that this is the output I get, which again, it shouldn't be too unfamiliar. I think everyone's probably seen this, this graph in some form, everyone's producing these plots, but now you can produce it yourself. So, um, you know, we can do it ourselves in our, and we can now do whatever we want, do whatever queries we want on this data set. Um, and we can use the same kind of pattern to do it. Um, I also, we did get that rolling mean as well. So let's try and add that. Now, the beauty of ggplot is whenever you want to add another layer or another uh, you know, graph on top of it, all you have to do is take the original plot that we had saved and add a new layer. And the layer we're going to add is this G on line, which is a, a line layer, a line graph layer. Um, and all I have to do is tell it what the mappings are, so what to put on the x-axis, what to put on the y-axis, and then I've got a few, um, you know, uh, plotting uh, graphical parameters. I've told it to, to be a little bit of a thicker line and to use the red color. And we can see very nicely we've got our seven-day smooth average mean um, layered on top of our existing plot. All right. Um, what if we only wanted a single LGA? You know, we did this for the whole of New South Wales. What if I only care about Wollongong LGA? Well, we can apply our filter function um, from, our, from our dplyr package uh, to our cases data set, and then effectively do the same code as we did before. So all I'm going to do now is add LGA name into our grouping function. I'll get the counts for each of the LGAs there. Um, and within the cases LGA, I've, didn't, I've done this because then we can um, easily filter between other, uh, other LGAs later on. So you don't have to pick Wollongong if you want to pick, you know, Karingai or Albury or um, the Shoalhaven, you can, uh, you know, all you have to do is change this filter argument here. Um, and the other thing I'm going to do is I'm only going to look at uh, cases after the 1st of June this year, because we didn't have many cases before then. So I think it's more interesting to focus on the second wave where we got quite a few cases. Um, I do the same thing as I did before. I complete my data set with notification dates now going from the 1st of Ju June, 2021 uh, till two days ago. And I'm gonna make sure that any days that we didn't have any rows originally, I'm gonna make them zero. Um, and I'm going to, again, uh, add my average, my rolling mean. I can do all the steps we did in multiple steps last time. I can put it all into the pipeline syntax, one after the other. I do this, then I do this, then I do this, then I do this, then I do this, and then I do this. All right. Um, and then we just have to produce our, our 
GG plot for the LGA, uh, Wollongong LGA. We again, same kind of arguments as we have before, except I've changed the title to reflect that we're only looking at Wollongong. But again, all I've done is change the data set here. Instead of cases New South Wales, we're using cases LGA Willow. And I've changed my title down here, but the rest of the code is effectively the same. And I get this kind of visualization. So we can see, you know, we had a bit of a, a rough time in September and October, but we're kind of coming out of it now. Alrighty. But that, that's all well and good, but let's get this moving. Let's get this animated because I want to make it a little bit more interesting. Um, I want to try and really show off the, the trajectory in which it went up. So we can, um, you know, structure it based on a time variable, running in time, reflecting the uh, speed of per day um, in scaling. So all I have to do in order to, to get this animated is to load this GG animate package. I'm also loading this GIF ski, um, which is a, a, rend a GIF renderer um, that allows us to uh, save it in a GIF format, our, our resulting animation. But all I have to do is take my cases will load plot that I already, um, I already created with ggplot. Um, I'm gonna change the title now to reflect that we are changing. We're gonna be looking at an animation. So it's gonna change across days. So I'm going to have the same uh, you know, title we had before, but this time I'm gonna add this subtitle that says what the current date is in our animation. Um, and this frame along, this just refers to whatever frame we're up to in the transition reveal function, which is effectively where we get our animation from, how we transition between each frame is decided by this transition reveal function. Um, and the transition reveal is, is a special transition function that effectively keeps what has already been revealed. Um, and so it's not a, an animation where it jumps, uh, you know, um, it's a, you know, and it looks at the current day, it also keeps everything that's already come through. So it's gradually revealing a plot rather than showing certain states at individual days. And we tell it which dimension, which variable we want to animate it across. I'm telling you to animate across notification dates, so effectively across time. And this argument here, this view follow, means that it will effectively, uh, the axes will change based on uh, the scale of the data. So um, our axis will change to account for, um, you know, when the, our cases go up and when they go back down. Um, so we can see uh, very clearly moving, uh, moving in different scales. All right, so um, once I've got this all set up, all I have to do is render it. So I use this animate function here. I tell it to render my saved GG animate um, object. I tell it what to render it as. So I'm telling it to render it as a GIF. Um, it's going to save it into my working directory, this GIF in my working directory. I told it to do five frames per second um, with 150 frames. And I want it to pause um, on the last frame for, for uh, you know, the equivalent of 20 frames. And so when I render this animation, it comes across looking like this. So you can see how the, um, how the scales change um, as time goes on. And we can also gradually reveal um, the case numbers as they, as they come up each day. And we notice here, I've got my date changing as well because we instructed it to do that. So it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Once you've got your GG plot set up, just a few additional arguments to be added to the end of the, the object. And we can produce really nice animated graphs um, for the COVID cases. Now I'm going to, um, you can have the y-axis scale constant if you want. Um, all you have to do is fix y. Um, I will show you in the next animation, we're gonna have to fix the x-axis. So it's very similar kind of thing. Um, all right. so. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the other data set we downloaded, which this world vaccination data. Um, and in it, it has, you know, different vaccine uh, amounts of vaccinations given. 
per each day for many, many different countries. Um, the issue with this data set is there's a lot of missing. There's a lot of missing because not every country reports every day. Um, and there's also quite a lot of countries. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just pick 10 countries. Now I've only picked these 10 countries um, because they have high vaccination and also they report very regularly. And I just kind of randomly pick um, countries that I was kind of interested in seeing how Australia compares to. Um, so we've got you know, the United States, United Kingdom, France, but if you were to repeat this exercise at home, you can really pick any countries you want. And you can pick more than 10 if you want. Um, it doesn't have to be 10. I've also added this world argument at the end, which is the, the total vaccination rate for the world in general as a function of its of, of size. Okay, so we're going to set this up. Um, we've got a lot of work we've got to do to get this in the right format, but luckily our pipeline um, architecture allows us to do this pretty straightforwardly. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to drop all those other, you know, there's lots of other columns here. We don't need them. So I'm going to only select the columns I'm interested in, which is the date, location, which is which country, and how many people were fully vaccinated per 100. I'm going to make sure R knows that the date that I'm using is, is a date. So I'm going to format it as a date. And I'm going to filter out all other, I'm, going, I'm only going to, select the countries that I've selected in this country's vector up here. So I'm only going to select the, the uh, countries that are within this vector of countries. And I'm also going to restrict just because, um, you know, different <laughs> countries had different vaccination dates starting. I'm going to restrict the date from the 1st of April going forward. Um, and I'm also going to stop it at the 1st of November because some uh, countries haven't yet updated it for the last week. So um, it's best to just, you know, give us a little bit of wiggle room in the side. All right, um, I'm then gonna group by location and I'm going to sort my data set by location and date. Um, I'm doing this because I want, because there might be some missing points within my data set. So not a, a country might have not um, updated in this data set or wasn't recorded for a particular date. So what I'm going to do is sort for each individual country by date, and then I'm going to fill down the previous days, or um, the previous if it's an if it's missing the previous day's vaccination rate. So I'm going to end up with a fully complete list, um, and it's still going to be in that you know non-decreasing form that we want of our vaccination rate. And I'm doing my direction down because I've sorted it. Um, by increasing dates. <laughs> yeah. um, now, once I've done that, I don't need a group by location anymore. Now I want to group by date because what I want to do is for each day, I want to know which country had the best vaccination rate or what was the ranking of each country on each of the date. So I'm going to group by date. And then for each day, I'm going to calculate the rank um, of that country, so for the people fully vaccinated per, per 100. I've added this little one over ranked location because occasionally countries might have the same vaccination date. So this just applies a kind of alphabetical correction. So when there's a matching date, then whoever's got comes first in the alphabet, they're gonna go up first in rank. So we have a, in a set ranking, there's no double ups for every single, for every single country. Um, I'm using the negative rank here because what that will do is effectively say that the top score will get a rank of one. So the person with the highest vaccination rate will get a rank of one, and then the second highest will get a rank of two, so on and so forth. I'm also going to create a value label, um, which just gives me my people fully vaccinated per 100. I'm going to make it as a percentage because that's how we usually think of it. Um, and I'm going to save that in this column here, the value label column. And the last thing I'm going to do is resort my data so that I'm sorted it by rank. So it lists one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten for each day um, of the data set. And we end up with something looking like this. So I've got for each day, I've got a rank of each country. All right. So now let's make our plot 
um, put our plot together. So we've got our first layer, which just tells me the mappings of um, the world vax and what data set to use. So I've told it to use on the x-axis the rank. Um, I've also told it to group by location to use a different color for each location um, and use a different color frame for each location. I'm then gonna put a tile. So this is effectively just a rectangle I'm putting in and I'm saying, um, I want this rectangle to be, have the height of the people fully vaccinated per 100. And I want to have a width of 0 0.9. Um, I've put this Y here because that tells the um, GG plot where to actually center this, this tile, uh, which is you know halfway, but if we center it at fully, people fully vaccinated per 100 on two, then um, that will mean that it will go from zero to people fully 100. All right, I'm also gonna add my text layers. So I've got my location label I'm going to add. I'm just gonna make sure that's to the left, the far left of my, um, of my plot. I'm on, and I'm also going to plot my um, people fully vaccinated per 100 label. Um, and I'm gonna make sure that's the right of the plot, okay? I'm also going to flip the X and Y axis um, because it's often nicer with these types of animated graphs to have them as a horizontal um, bar rather than as vertical bars. I'm going to remove my y axis, my y axis labels. I'm going to reverse my x axis so that one is now at the top, and then it goes one, two, three, four, five, six. So our, our highest vaccinated is at the top, and it works our way down. And I'm going to remove my legend because the, we we can see we've labeled it correctly. Um, using this geom text, we don't need a, a legend to, to, to tell us what color matches what. Um, don't worry too much about this. This is just a plot, uh, a theme um, plot. All I've effectively done is made, removed a heap of plotting features. So I've made the axis null and blank and the axis text blank and the background blank and lots and lots of things. I did widen the margin, which is important because that will give me enough room to um, plot my geom text, my labels on either side. But effectively, all, I, all I've done is made everything blank. <laughs> and the last thing is I need to animate. I need to tell it what to animate across. So I'm going to animate across date. I'm going to have a transition length of four. So this number of frames to transition between each country. I'm going to have it sit for each day on two. And I'm going to fit, view follow. So here's the fixed x equal true. So this is going to keep the x-axis the same, which is in this instance, because we reverse the axis is actually the y-axis. Um, and I'm going to add these labels. So it's a lot of work, but eventually what do we end up with? We end up with something that looks a bit like this. So when we render our animation, um, I've got a, a changing plot where each, each day we see which country has got the highest vaccination rate um, and yeah, which country doesn't. So you can see Australia's not performing too well, but we come home strongly in the end. Um, I'll let everyone else, I'll let you really watch this through. So, okay, here we go. All right, um, the, the next point I wanted to look at is visualizing map data. Now we can actually get maps in the form that we can read in art directly from the data.gov website. Um, so if you go into data.gov, we see um, we can get a map of all New South Wales with each of the local government areas properly plotted in it. I can download this file and read it straight into R as a, a shape file. Um, you don't have to worry too much about how, how it's being saved, but effectively all I have to do to plot a map of New South Wales with all the local government areas is to use ggplot with this gmsf for the shape file. All right, so can we integrate our vaccination data we had before? We absolutely can. We remember we loaded this in from the health website and we end up with a data set that looks a bit like this. Um, unfortunately, it's formatted as a text with some percentages. So we're gonna to have to do a little bit of alteration to our data set to get rid of that. So all I'm doing is I'm going to only select um, New South Wales LGAs. 
I'm going to remove anything with a greater than symbol because if it's 90, if it's over 95%, it just says oh, greater than 95%. So I'm going to remove that greater than symbol. And I'm also going to remove the percentage symbol and I'm going to convert this back into proportions. Okay. So we end up with a data set that looks like this. And then all we have to do is we have to um, add this vaccine dose information into our shape file, our shape data frame. Now, if you notice here, there was actually um, multiple, multiple instances for the same LGA. So because of that, what I've done is I've told it, I've told um, R to repeat the dose um, for how many times each LGA is mentioned so that it matches up perfectly one-to-one. -one. And again, I just need to make my ggplot New South Wales LGA layer and I've added my do double dose as a fill. So I filled in to color code it based on um, how, how much, uh, what proportion of people have um, gotten their vaccination. Alrighty, um, last step, we're gonna put this all together into a shiny dashboard. Um, so the first thing you need to do is create a little folder somewhere in your, in your directory, working directory, and add an R script. You can just call it apt.r. It doesn't have to be called apt.r, but it's often easier to call it that. Um, and we can put in our basic structure of our R shiny dashboard um, within that, that script. And this is it. So effectively, we have three main sections. We have what I'm calling the preamble, which is the thing above um, the, U, the, the UI and the server function. So this is just the one-off code that we run, usually loading in data to set up our app. We then have our user interface, which tells Shiny how to display our dashboard. And we also have our server, which is effectively like the calculator the, the program running behind it, which underpins all of our user interface. Okay. So in a shiny dashboard, we have to always pair off between the user interface and the server. And we always have to make sure all the stuff we need in order to load the data and present the data is put into the preamble. And finally, you just use this function, which opens a shiny app with this user interface and the server underpinning it. So if I was to just load this shiny app as it is now, I will get this blank, um, this blank feature here. And this is because it's part of the shiny dashboard. It's already got some custom, um, some predetermined, pre-filled uh, variables underpinning the, the display. All right, um, so make sure we're gonna add all of these functions that we used previously to our preamble. Um, it, you know, we need, we, make, we need to make sure we're not missing any packages, otherwise our code won't run. I think I've got all of them there, but if I've missed any, I'll you know, have a look through the previous code and make sure there's nothing missing. Um, and we can build the basic skeleton of our dashboard now. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to add into my sidebar, which is this part here, four items for uh, each of the visualizations we kind of looked at. Um, one for the New South Wales cases, one for the cases by LGA, one for the vaccine map, and one for the world vaccination data we, we looked at. And within the UI, I'm going to have a different tab items. This is effectively a different page that corresponding to each of these menu items. And I've just put in this H2 here is a heading. And what we're going to do is just look at each of these tab items individually and build up each page based on um, the different, different visualizations. So remember this plot, we're going to put this into our tab one. Um, but what I'm also going to do is going to allow the user to select which date it starts from. Rather than starting from the 25th of January, I'm going to allow you to change what is the starting point. So if you want to zoom in on the second wave, you can, um, or you can move into a closer to, when it, to the current day, however close you want. So I've still got my heading but I'm going to add under this tab item, this fluid row, um, which is effectively just telling it to be a dynamically changing row based on how I've stretched the screen. Um, I've given it the title, a title, and I've also put in this slider input 
I've labeled the slider input so I can reference it in my server. And I've told it what label to put on it. And I've told it what is my minimum, what is my maximum, and what is my default starting and told it that it's a date. Okay. So when you, when you load this, I've also added this fluid row down the bottom, which we're going to eventually put our plot in. <laughs> we're going to eventually put our plot in. So when I load this, it looks something like this. Right now, there's no plotting going on because I haven't linked my server yet. But at this cage, I've just got my, my input arguments, which can then be used within our graphing parameter. So for my, pre, for my server, I have to add this to the preamble, which is effectively loading in the data. We've already done that, so I'm not going to go through that. But um, all I have to do is create an output, um, a certain variable of our output. I'm going to call it cases from South Wales. And in this output, I'm going to render a plot based on a filtered notification date, which is selected based on the input of date select. Remember, we label date select in our slider input. Then all I have to do is use the same ggplot code we used before. Um, all I've done is use the pipeline um, notation to sub into ggplot, but effectively you just think about it as taking this and subbing it into ggplot. And I can produce the same plot we had before, but this time dynamically changing based on, um, based on what starting value I've put in. And all I've done to the, the, the tab one is I've added plot output, um, whichever cases in South Wales we needed. Well, so that's the first one. We've got four, three more to go, but we can do this quite quickly. So um, for the second one, we're gonna do our New South Wales cases by LGA. We're gonna add this to the, our preamble because we've already loaded in the cases data set. And now I'm going to put in a, a select input, but this time it's going to be a list input. And so I've called it LGA select. This is the label I've put to it. And I've chose, told it the choices to use within this drop down menu to be the different levels of the LGA, LGA name. So that's effectively what are the all different cases we see within this column of cases LGA. Um, I've also added a spare row down the bottom for when we got to put our plot in um, once we link it to our server. So we've got our server code here. Now, effectively, what I'm doing is the same as what I did before, except this time I'm filtering based on LGA name, and I'm going to select the LGA associated with whatever LGA was selected in my input. And again, we run the same code as we kind of did before. I still have to complete it. Um, but the same code we used when we, we selected it in the LGA Willow code before. Um, and I need to update my tab two UI with this plot output argument down the bottom, the cases LGA. All right. Um, and so effectively, when I'm finished, I end up with something looking a bit like this. So it allows me to change based on different LGAs um, sorry, different LGAs, the, the um, case numbers. All right, the last, the last um, interactive one I want to add in is this New South Wales vaccine map. So again, we're going to load in all the stuff we had before. Um, all the, all the, we're going to add that to the preamble, uh, all the things we did before to get the data set ready. But now I'm going to add in again the select input, but this time I'm going to only give it two choices a single dose or double dose. And so I'm gonna allow the user to pick whether or not they wanna see the New South Wales map for a single dose vaccine rate or a double dose vaccine rate. Um, and I've already just put it in here. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna call my output plot LGA vax. So when I look to my server code, I've got my output being called LGA vax. And I've just put in a little if else function, which says if my input dose select is equal to single dose, then plot the single doses. If it uh, selects the double dose, then plot the double doses. And we end up with a, uh, a diagram that looks like that. For our last tab, um, I'm not gonna actually render the animation in the thing. I'm just gonna use the previously rendered animation because that takes quite a long time to build. But all I'm going to do is make sure I've got a folder name 
www. And I'm going to place this animated GIF file that we rendered before into that folder. So into my, my working directory folder. Um, well, into the www folder within my working directory folder. And then all I have to do is update my tab four UI code with um, my heading, my fluid row, and to feed in this image, which is a, a, top, a ten, uh, our top 10 animation GIF. That's it. I just click the run app button and I'm done. So I'll, I'll just show you very quickly what this looks like in, in actual actuality. So I've got my cases. I can split between my different um, tabs. I've got my vaccination rate for the 10 countries here. I've got my vaccine map here, and I can switch between single dose and double dose. It might take a little bit long to load because my computer's not the best. <laughs> um, I can pick between different LGAs. Can I find, oh, let's go to Shellhaven. There we go. So I can load, I can look at the different case numbers in each of the LGAs. And for New South Wales cases, I can adjust the starting date and I can just focus it in to the more recent times. All righty, um, that's about it. I will just put up um, my last slide, which is just a reminder, if you do have any questions, um, you're welcome to email me. That's my email address there. And please remember to check out the Statistical Consulting Centre on the, on the website in case you have any queries you want to chat to me about.